Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Welcome to tonight's event. We ask that you turn off all cell phones and electronic devices at this time. Still photography, video, and audio recording are not permitted. Please take a moment to look around for the available emergency exits. In case of an emergency, calmly proceed to the nearest emergency exit. AA 110 Questions is now in session. Please welcome Brett Steele, Dean of the School of the Arts and Architecture. Thank you, everybody, so much for coming in for week three of 10 questions. And this evening's question, what is beauty? Um, as I've said before in these introductions, Kathy Opie, one of the world's greatest photographers and a colleague of ours here in this school at UCLA has said it this way. Ideas always start with questions. And as I think we all know today also, the asking of questions is what drives research in almost any human form today across the humanities, in the sciences, in medicine, and indeed, as a predicate to this course, in what we think of as the arts. If you'll allow me to take just a few minutes, I'd like to briefly introduce the course for those of you that are new to it this evening in our public audience. And after that, we'll have the honor and privilege of introducing our four terrific guests who will get on with a conversation around tonight's question. Um, I'm Brett Steele. Uh, dean of the School of the Arts and Architecture, and like many of you, very much a student of this course um, and everything that's coming out of it so far. You are joining us for a very special experiment in higher education today in which a combination of students and members of a larger public come together for a rolling program that will look at each of the weekly questions that we've set as an agenda. This is very much a combination of a student audience. We have 80 students that are enrolled from across the entire campus and not just here at the School of the Arts and Architecture. And those of you who have come in from beyond the borders of the campus this evening to enjoy this event and everything it offers. I'd like to say as a part of my introduction today something briefly about the materials that we also have available as some of you have come and asked about that after some of our previous uh, discussions. We are striving here to make the state of art education very literally more viable and visible to a larger audience of people thinking about the state of the world today. We're working to make the university more porous, to bring down some of the borders between highly specialized forms of knowledge and expertise that make up UCLA, like many other research institutions today, and more than anything for your students in the audience to find a way to make the work you do in not just this classroom or this class, but also in the various performance halls, seminar spaces, on the stages and in studios, more open and available to larger audiences around our work. This is very much a course about the work that all of you are doing as students. <clears throat> and in addition to what I've already said about trying to make the work we're doing here at the university more accessible, a point to make tonight, especially in our attempts to broaden the conversation. And this follows on from a couple of weeks of looking up and periodically seeing a laptop or a mobile phone in operation is that we encourage you to do that and to do it in real time during this session. Um, for those of you that are interested and have immediate responses and ideas and thoughts about some of the things being said, simply go online and do that. We've got all sorts of uh, uh, portholes and access um, places to do that. Please try and use, um, if you can, the hashtag UCLA10Questions. It's yours. Make use of it and get the work out. You can also, of course, be sure to visit um, arts.ucla.edu slash 10 questions, which is like how machines talk today, I think. I think if you just ask Google or Siri to go to UCLA 10 questions, you'll get there. The course materials, including these terrific presentations that our guests are arriving with every week, are available to all of us and on that website. Please, please make use of it and understand that to be a part of any audience today is to be a part of multiple audiences. And indeed, that's very much one of the premises that this kind of a course is testing and learning from, which is how it is we all operate and think and live across multiple domains. Over these 10 weeks, 10 questions bring together 40 terrific faculty from across 
our entire campus. Students enrolled in the course also include majors of the School of Arts and Architecture, but many other departments across this entire UCLA campus. In addition to being here Tuesday evenings, uh, our students meet weekly with their graduate teaching assistants to discuss these questions and create their own responses to them in a variety of forms and formats and to reiterate the kind of conversation that's taking place up here on the stage this evening in their own interesting and individuated ways. Each of the questions being asked in this series is drawn from a critical engagement of arts practitioners. Our questions are central to artistic practice today. This we know because we shaped and curated this list from an ongoing conversation with artists across this school and others here on campus. By sharing these inquiries with not only artists, but also scientists, scholars, and activists, we believe that we are building a firmer foundation here at UCLA for understanding both the disciplinary forms of knowledge essential to research and creation today, but as well the different individuated perspectives that experience and live lives and careers within those fields. Um, a couple of short thanks, please, in advance of, of me introducing tonight's guests. Um, ten questions. This course, its format, its design, its impetus is very much the work of Victoria Marks, a choreographer, a choreographer and associate dean um, in the School of the Arts and Architecture. Victoria has developed this initiative alongside Anne-Marie Burke and her terrific team here within the school who have worked with Victoria and with Marilyn Pace here at the School of the Arts and Architecture for her considerable expertise in the running and organizing of courses here on campus to make sure this initiative in this form as both public and academic activities could go forward in the way it has. Please join me in thanking all of them for that effort. <laughs> As I have done before, we need also to thank World Arts Culture Dance for allowing us to use this terrific room and venue here, not only for making the room available, but for the combination of technical expertise and magic that makes sure things like lights and microphones and cameras, air, heat, electricity, and all of that stuff works in the way we need it here. And thank you, everybody in the department, for making that possible. So with that as a broader introduction, let me just briefly introduce each of our four guests who have agreed a running order and in the form that we've done this in the previous weeks, will each begin this evening's conversation with a short presentation themselves. Come on out here. Our guests are here tonight already. Thank you. Thanks. As, as was the case in the first two sessions, we have four guests with us this evening. Just to briefly introduce them to all of you, J. Ed Ariza. <laughs> is head of the UCLA School of Theater, Film, and Television's MFA acting program. He is a principal actor and original member of the City Company, which he founded with Ann Bogart and Tadashi Suzuki in 1992. He has a long and accomplished career working on multicultural cross-disciplinary projects as writer, director, and performer. Paul Barber is an evolutionary conservation geneticist. As professor in the Department of Ecology and Evolutionary Biology and principal investigator of the Barber Lab, his research integrates genetics, ecology, oceanography, and geology to understand the processes that promote speciation in marine environments, creating marine biodiversity hotspots. Marla Burns, in the center chair, um, has served as Shirley, the Shirley and Ralph Shapiro Director of the Fowler Museum, our immediate neighbor to the east of here, although I've lost track of the east in this room, it's right there, um, at UCLA since 2001. Marla is a curator and scholar of African arts. Her work focuses primarily on the arts of northeastern Nigeria. Marla is a three-time Bruin. She received her undergraduate, graduate, and PhD in art history degrees from here at UCLA. 
and specializes in African art and was director of the University Art Museum at the University of California, Santa Barbara, before coming here to the Fowler. And finally, Kathleen McHugh <laughs> is a feminist media theorist and critic. Kathleen teaches in the Department of English and in the Cinema and Media Studies program in the Department of Film, Television, and Digital Media at UCLA, where she currently serves as chair from 2005 to 2012, and again in 2013 and 14, she served as director of the UCLA Center for the Study of Women. Please join me in welcoming all four of our guests. Thank you, everybody, so much for coming in. We have agreed uh, in advance a running order for this evening's presentation, which I need to bring up on the show, and Paul will begin this evening's presentations. Thanks, everybody. So I'm a biologist. And when I thought about what beauty is in biology, I thought about perhaps talking about biodiversity and all of the amazing different forms of life that are out in nature. And I also thought about perhaps talking about complexity, because these ecosystems that these organisms inhabit and that we share with them on this planet are incredibly complex. But I thought instead I'd focus on the idea of beauty being simplicity. And this may seem a little odd to have diversity and, and complexity and simplicity in the same sentence, but it's simplicity that gives rise to complexity and creates diversity. Now, you can see this by watching origami be made. You can start with a single piece of paper and through the simple action of simply folding that piece of paper, you can over time, create a very complicated object like this little fox. Hmm. Uh, impressively, it gets even more complicated than that. This is a single piece of paper, as is this, <laughs> and this. Now, there's natural origami as well. So this is a ladybug extending its wings from underneath its carapace. And this ladybug, the wings have to be flexible enough to be folded, to be protected underneath its carapace, but it has to be strong enough in order to be able to support flight. And it's the complexity of something like the folding of these ladybug wings that scientists use and engineers use to guide the development of new technology and new approaches to technology, such as this folding and expanding solar array on a satellite. Now, there's an entire field of study where people are developing new masks and new tools to understand how to create different shapes through folding. And yet, this ladybug doesn't need that mask. The ladybugs figured it out all on their own. So how did this happen? Well, it's through simplicity. And what I want to introduce you to is a simple idea that was first put forward by Sir Alfred Russell Wallace on your left and Charles Darwin on your right. And they proposed a very simple idea of evolution through natural selection. And natural selection is a principle by which each slight variation of a trait, if useful, is preserved. Now, another way of phrasing this is that individual organisms that have traits that are better suited to their environment have a higher probability of surviving, and in that have a higher probability of leaving more offspring that carry those same traits. Now, an example of this, a classic example, comes from peppered moths. Peppered moths uh, are found in Britain, and 
they live on the bark of trees. And as you can see, this light with dark modeling of this particular moth makes it particularly well camouflaged on this bark. This is what trees looked like before the Industrial Revolution in England. After the Industrial Revolution, through the emission of smoke from burning coal, the bark looked like this. Now, suddenly, that moth that was incredibly well camouflaged sticks out like a sore thumb. However, you should notice up to the right, there is a darker colored moth. And it is through the process of slightly darker colored moths being less susceptible to predation over time that will yield that darker form. Now, we can see this uh, experimentally. People have done experiments where they've raised birds, and they've only allowed the birds with the largest beaks to reproduce. And over 20 generations, what you see is the beak size that you start with ends up being much smaller than where you end up. And what is amazing about this very simple process is that by these minor variations occurring over long periods of time gives rise to diversity and complexity. So if we look at something like a seahorse, this is the standard shape of a seahorse, but there are also amazing seahorses that look like this. The leafy sea dragon evolved from a seahorse that looked like the first one that I showed you. But over time, because it lived in a kelp forest environment, it began to develop a morphology that closely resembled the kelp. This is a tree frog um, common to Arizona. And this is this ancestral form over many, many uh, years of, of evolution through natural selection gave rise to a form like this that looks like a piece of granite. And it's, for those of you that can't see it, it's right in the middle facing this way. All right? So natural selection amazingly can converge on a common solution, even though it's a random process. So all three organisms here have a very similar morphology. They have a very similar shape. So the shark represent fish. They evolved about 420 million years ago. In the middle is an ichthyosaur. This is an extinct group of reptiles that actually evolved from a terrestrial group of reptiles that re-entered the sea. And as it re-entered the sea, it began to, over long periods of time, change in a way to resemble a similar morphology. Similarly, with the dolphin there, those ancestors to the dolphins came from land, and they re-entered the sea. And through natural selection acting in very similar ways across these very different groups of organisms, we end up with very similar forms. Uh, this is true in plants as well. Uh, well ex uh, a well-known example is in cactus and uh, euphorbs. And the most, com most recent common ancestor to these, these two plants is 130 million years ago. And yet, they look strikingly similar through the small changes of natural selection acting over long periods of time. And one of the cool things about natural selection is that there is this aspect of randomness. And so you can get uniquely bizarre creatures like a platypus that are like, you know, a cross between a beaver, an otter, and a duck. <laughs> and there's no rhyme or reason, but the simplicity of natural selection acting in a way to create something um, as unique as this. So what I'd like you to think about when you look at the diversity out in our world and 
you look at all of the amazing animals and you see the complexity of these ecosystems on this planet of which we are stewards, what I'd like you to think about is that all of this happened through the very simple process of natural selection. And through this simplicity is beauty. Thank you. Good evening. Good evening. <clears throat> Good evening. Good. I'm, I'm hoping that we can have a dialogue and a conversation. Thank you for being here tonight. I know it's uh, evening. It's Los Angeles, so it probably took you a bit of an effort to come here. So I'm very grateful for your time. Um, I'm a performing artist. So let me begin by saying that the ex opinions expressed here tonight reflect only myself, not the School of Theater, Film, and Television, and especially the theater department. <laughs> OK. As a performing artist and educator, my view is necessarily informed by the work to which I have devoted my life. So tonight, with your indulgence, I'm interested in discussing beauty in the laboratory of art, specifically the art of performance, which is inclusive, of course, of also directing, writing, and design. I want to discuss beauty and the concept of craft and discipline as a search for and an appreciation of beauty. I'd like to share an appreciation of the preparation and the rigor it actually takes to make art look easy, simple, and sometimes accessible. I recently performed with my company, The City Company of Performance, uh, a show that ran for a month at the Getty Villa. And then after that, I just came back. We took it to uh, the Brooklyn Academy of Music in New York. While we were in rehearsal at the Getty, um, a crew came out from BAM and did a short promo of which I'm going to show you a bit of uh, an excerpt. Bear with me. It's about a minute 45. I may talk over. We have long wanted to do the Bacchae, but we have also been terrified of it. It's a story that is uh, both simple and complicated. Here, and then we are very, very excited that we'll be taking it directly to the BAM Harvey stage. Are you trying to spoil me rot? The god Dionysus comes back into Thebes, disguised as a human, to, among other things, proselytize and spread his religion. He's been provocated to seek revenge on the house of Pentheus, the young, newly seated king, because of Pentheus's fierce denial of this new religion. Through many machinations, Dionysus gets Pentheus to go up to the mountain to spy upon his band of Bacchans. But the ultra plan is that he's going to have Pentheus murdered by his own mother's hand. The violence of the action, what that would be, is much wilder in our imaginations than it could ever be in any other form. But the humanity of that moment when Agave has this realization that she is the real thing is something that we want to experience channeled through an actor. Part of our background comes out of our DNA by being in association with the Suzuki Company of Toga in Japan. In many ways, that training came about in an attempt to bring a contemporary body up to the demands and the parameters that the Greek plays demand. Every day before rehearsal, we uh, not only train with Suzuki training, but also viewpoints. And the viewpoints is an improvisation in which the actors actually essentially can look at the play out of time. In other words, they're not performing it in order with the characters in order. They're in a sense hypertexting on the ideas of the play. Dionysus says, and Thebes, you are in danger of shutting down and becoming smaller and becoming hegemonic and becoming a kind of dictatorship. Greek theater was, we're living in a society right now that has really important questions to come. So you notice that that was a bit of the rehearsal process, not a finished project. Uh, there wasn't any big costumes, not a lot of lights. 
I wanted you to get an idea of the tremendous amount of work it takes to put something, when you go see a show, it's an hour and a half, maybe two hours. If it's, uh, if it's abstract, maybe three hours. But uh, it takes a tremendous amount of time. If we're lucky, four to six weeks, uh, eight hours a day, six days a week, 48 hours times uh, six times six, however many hours that is, to present to you, not including all of the uh, research that we all do individually, the rigor of the research, to put the 90 minutes that you might see on the stage. So one of the reasons I didn't show you the finished project, aside from the fact that most stage productions look terrible on film and video, and especially our city company productions, they can either be very loud and jarring, will that work? Or they can be very still and quiet, like that. So rather than talk about the beauty or lack of beauty of a finished theatrical process, I'm going to talk to you, share some thoughts about the rehearsal process. While I love and I was first drawn into the performing arts by a sense of community, joy, and cast parties, <laughs> for myself, the rehearsal process, and please don't get me wrong, uh, my, the rehearsal process is actually more exciting, meaningful, and creative than the actual performance. And don't get me wrong, I am both thrilled and terrified by performing live on stage, like I am tonight. I'm a little terrified to be here tonight. And I also understand that without you, without the audience, a play as I love and understand it can't be complete. Oh, and I want to challenge you as an audience, and sometimes I want to, maybe often, I want to confuse you as an audience, but still I understand, as the comedian Sarah Bernhardt says, without you I'm nothing. Without an audience, the, the work that I do doesn't exist. A rehearsal is only a means to an end. The end is the act of communicating with an audience. And that communication involves a sense of rigor and craft. Most audiences don't know or understand the rigor of a good rehearsal process, and you shouldn't. Good technique is hidden technique. We don't want you to see how we do it. We just want you to see the characters in an extreme circumstance telling you a story that I hope perhaps is important for you. By nature, I'm a, and profession, I'm a storyteller. And often while my work as a member of the city company, which is based in New York, where I, the work that I do with the city company is uh, I often practice and create in the abstract world in the modern or postmodern world. Even though I often work in these kind of wacky postmodern and post postmodern worlds, I'm constantly asking myself, what is the story? What am I saying? And most importantly, why am I saying it? Why should I say it and why should people care? Why should people come and if we're lucky, pay money to come see what we're trying to say? So I don't work only exclusively in the abstract world, but I work in a large part with the city company and in my own work as well in the abstract world. Um, I believe that you, the viewer, the hearer, the shared experiencer, you might not completely or at all sometimes understand what I'm, the story that I'm trying to share with you, but I personally feel I have to know and understand the narrative that I'm trying to share with you, even if you only get abstract imagery. Does that make sense? The more abstract a story is, the more I have to understand what it is I'm trying to share with you. So that you have a sense, maybe not exactly of what I'm trying to say, but you get a sense of a point of view. You get a, sen a sense of something important. You get a sense of something that you might want to pay attention to. And that takes rigor. So what does all this have to do with beauty? What is beauty? For me, I believe that quite simply, and it sounds rather simplistic, beauty is the search for beauty. For myself at this juncture in my life, beauty has become a sense of art and artisanship, of craft and discipline. And while beauty might be in the eye of the beholder, for myself as an artist, based in performance, as a director, a playwright, an actor, and an educator, I look for beauty in the attempt of virtuosity. 
Bad acting is easier to talk about, easier to criticize than good acting. And we all do it. We all criticize bad acting. But good acting, harder to talk about. You know what you liked. Why did you like it? I'm not sure. But something about that touched me, reached me, moved me. And in theater, it's very ephemeral, good and bad. The bad stuff you do in theater, unless there's a critic in the audience, gone. The good stuff that you do, that's gone too. So if you go to see a play and you find something that moves you, something that's of interest to you, something that you love, count yourself lucky because no one is ever going to see that again. What is, what is beauty? Beauty in performance and beauty in rehearsal. For me, it's the beauty of preparation, the process, the ritual that connects artists through time, preparation of the space, of the body, of the tools of the trade. By space, I mean still. I find I take it as an honor with my students, with myself, with people I work on. In our company, we still make sure the place is clean and ready to start to work. Because we work a lot, you might have noticed, in rehearsal we work a lot in bare feet or in socks. You might have noticed that in the film. So we make sure that the room is prepared. We prepare our bodies. We do very rigorous physical training before every rehearsal. We do it before every show. And we do rigorous preparation in terms of research, deep research, and also in terms of what it is that we bring every day to the rehearsal process. So part of that rigor is not only being well prepared but being able to let go of it, let go of whatever you thought you were going to do, let it go because of what's happening in the room that day. Because the actor that you're working with tells you something that you've heard five times or six times or 25 times but says it in a different way. But the rigor to be in the moment, to be able to express yourself back and to really listen to what that actor is saying to you takes training and rigor. Where am I? So yes, the beauty of rigor, the beauty of preparation, the beauty of expressing yourself through exhaustion, pain, and discouragement. Uh, because that is a large part of the life of a performing artist in singing, in the world of dance, and in performance. It's a lot of disappointment. They say, I don't know if it's true, this is an anecdotal story, uh, we say it in the theater, so maybe dancers say the same thing about dancing. But in theater, we, I've heard it said often that uh, there are three of the most um, nerve-wracking uh, professions are landing, uh, and my father-in-law was a, a Navy jet pilot, landing uh, a jet at night on an aircraft carrier, going up and down. One second thing that they say is a brain surgeon performing brain surgery. Third thing, an actor on opening night. <laughs> it's terrifying. And yet, we keep doing it. Why do we do it? A sense of love, a sense perhaps of a search for beauty. The beauty, the connection of the deepest self, what drives one to the current moment. Why do we do this? Why do we want to be in that moment? Because that moment is important because we're trying to say something to the world. And for me as an artist, for the students that I work with at UCLA, that I'm privileged to work with here at UCLA, it's challenge our, challenging ourselves to be present in the world that we live in now. I don't find that beauty or art is a distraction from the world. I don't think that art is different or separated from the world. I think that my art puts me in the middle of the world. I try to find beauty in having to say terrifying, difficult things to an audience. Some of the things I say on stage, some of the things I ask my students to do or to say are very difficult. But we say them for a reason. I just finished a Greek play. I just finished a Bacchae by uh, Euripides in where, how are we doing on time? OK, great. Oh, is that over? Am I way over? Great, okay, I'm so sorry, I didn't look at that. I'll, I'll wrap it up very quickly, my apologies. Um, in the Bacchae, it, it's basically about the battle between opposing powers, old power, new power, religion, and the state. It ends up with a woman ripping the head off of her son while in an ecstatic, beside herself state. Why? To keep asking the questions of what is the meaning of power and what is the meaning of God. I think those are questions that we can still continue to ask ourselves now. 
Uh, let me finish up by saying this. I'm going to close by echoing something my new colleague Paul Barber said and wrote recently. Beauty is simplicity, complexity, and diversity. That's something that I long for, search for constantly in my own work. Simplicity, complexity, and diversity. In rehearsal, I look to discover and explore that. And then on stage, I try to artfully recreate that moment of discovery eight times a week. I can only do that by relying on the technique that I've learned through uh, exploration of rigor and preparation. Thank you. How long did I go over? It's down for the slides a little bit. Thank you. Good evening, everyone. Thank you, Brett. Thank you, Vic, for inviting me to participate in this program. Clicker. Mm -hmm. Thank, Thank you. My you. Apologies. Okay. Sorry. Ideals of beauty are socially and culturally constructed and are used to express difference. Although rarely practiced today, for many ethnic groups in sub Saharan Africa, arts of the body rendered women and men attractive at the same time they served as powerful expressions of identity and belonging. Skin is a highly mutable and expressive medium, and for many cultures around the world, including our own, its irreversible transformations and very particular patterns of modification and ornamentation possess beauty, as well as profound social and spiritual significance. It is not surprising that in most cases, these programs of scarification begin before or during puberty, so that their completion in stages coincides with the physiological and social transition from childhood to sexual maturity, marriage, and childbirth. Only by completing these age-based changes does a woman become beautiful and marriageable. Anthropologists have considered it likely that the skin was the first canvas of humanity, a threshold between self and others that implies interaction and exchange. The use of the body for encoding symbols is ancient and is attested by cave art in the Tassili region of the Sahara from over eight to 9,000 years ago. African cultures have incised and sculpted skin to create patterns of meaning and identity which relate to ethnicity, kinship, social status, and gender. Scarifications were done by lifting the skin with a hook and then making shallow and deft cuts across it, which were then irritated with soot or red iron oxide, or other substances so that the scars stood in sharp relief against otherwise smooth skin. As illustrated by these two photographs of Bamaleke women from Cameroon, the geometric designs formed by meticulously cut rows of scars enhance the natural curves and flowing lines of a woman's young and fecund body, producing what have been called marks of civilization. The Tabwa of Southeastern Democratic Republic of the Congo covered themselves head to foot with scarifications, and one observer in the late 19th century wrote that they did so in the most artistic and symmetrical manner with raised spots and lines of relief. My colleague, Alan Roberts, a professor here in the Department of World Arts and Culture's Dance, and a foremost scholar of the Tabwa, describes this practice of scarification as seeking to perfect the body through a system of signs ready to be read. These scars were highly tactile and considered highly erotic, especially when a woman was young 
and the scars were fresh, aiding in conception, parenthood, and continuity. My own research was in northeastern Nigeria, and I show you a map, and I'm going to see if I can handle a laser pointer with my other hand here. Yes, I can't. Do you see that? Anyway, the three groups with whom I did uh, long-term field research are the Ganda, the Bina, and the Yungur. And this is a rather remote part of the country, very different from the highly urbanized south. It was a place that no one else had done any kind of sustained work in until I came to do that research in the early 1980s. The landscape was stunning. It was part of the savanna. Communities were small. Villages were also not very large. Houses were made of mud and sometimes concrete block and corrugated tin. But it was a place that stood outside of time. And so when I did my work, it was just at the end of body scarification being practiced because it was prohibited by local government officials in 1978. As you can imagine, between the onslaught of missionaries and Christianity, colonization, new governments ap in, in the post-independence era, making these marks was not considered modern, not considered appropriate. But I did study the women at the time who still bore the marks of full body scarification in these highly elaborate programs that were actually transacted over many years, sometimes in six stages, sometimes more, always beginning when a girl was young and the first marks always made over her navel to mark that part of her body that would be the guarantor of community survival and continuity. The marks were then done sequentially, leaving areas empty so that certain design patterns stood out as discrete entities, so that those designs became templates for their use on other things, making the woman's body that kind of template for meaning as it moved across different categories. These are two Ganda brides who were presented to their community after they should have completed all of their body markings, but had only done so with the marks that were over the navel and down the center of the torso because it had been prohibited. And they came out, they were ornamented, they were transformed, they became beautiful. And the important thing about undergoing this process is that it's not only a form of beautification, but it's also marking the fact that these permanent modifications to the body coincide with the irreversible forward march of physiology, that you move from childhood to adulthood, and then you become a proper member of society, and by doing so, you must look like an appropriate, perfected Ganda person. This was a neighboring group called the Binna. I'm sorry that, I don't know if you can dim the lights a little because her body shows you these marks, all these tiny, meticulous cuts that these programs of marking were highly regular, highly symmetrical, and highly specific. And maybe later I'll talk about why it is that this young woman doesn't look very happy with my photographing her because it was something I was very intent to do. I was trying to document this wonderful practice that was now outlawed and would soon be gone. But she's showing us most of her body and the designs that you see conform to the diagram that I've created. What became extremely interesting to me in doing the research in these communities and asking people about all the kinds of arts that they made was to look at how, as I mentioned, the body designs moved from a woman's skin to the surfaces of pottery, to the decorations in gourds, 
to paintings on architecture, and especially the way that the most important spirit pots were marked as appropriate containers and receptacles for the supernatural and for those spirits that even made it possible for those cuts to scar beautifully and not otherwise. And if you look at the scarring, and you can actually see it here, you can see how the scars become these tiny light areas against the skin. The body of that pot, which is named in Gungami, this is the Ganda's culture hero. They followed this perambulating pot to where they live. The pot becomes a bearer of memory, and the pot only looks right, and the spirit will only enter the receptacle so that people can interact with it when it looks perfected, just like a woman's body. And so this interesting way that the bodies of women became equal to the bodies of spirits as represented by objects that humans make is really a powerful message about how these signs are signs of belonging, of collective memory, of history, and really of the future. And of course, if we think about the fact that these women are no longer being marked, it's at least important to know that the memory of that design system, that program of beautification, has been retained in the objects that will indeed last, the objects that will keep going and become those permanent records of history and memory and the way people find access to expressing beauty. And I hope with this discussion that we can think about, even in our own culture, what it means when we mark ourselves, when we mark ourselves permanently with tattooing and piercing and all other kinds of ways and how we do so with dress. And I think it's important to acknowledge and respect that these systems of decoration are not unlike what we do, they're just different. And how important it is to value that difference and that um, way in which other people express what's important to them in their lives. Thank you. Hello. My remarks today will move from meditation to critique to aspiration. So my question, what is beauty? I think of beauty as a capacious, empty, conceptual space filled endlessly by objects, persons, or things that give their viewer or perceiver a rush of pleasure. Indeed, we say this or that person or thing is beautiful. But what is it that they are full of? Beauty is in an object or person, but it is also in the eye of the beholder. Thus, beauty is a relationship between eye and object, between sensation and quality between internal and external, between beholder and beheld. In the Western tradition, women frequently embody beauty. Poets, painters, and philosophers, frequently men, have tried to answer what it is that she is full of that so compels their pleasure. In words, paint, ink, and stone, they craft symmetry pleasing shape, color, or form according to the parameters of their desire. Their work captures, freezes beauty, renders it still and timeless. Beauty is a woman whose radiance poets compare to, quote, roses, sun, alabaster, and pearls, end quote. For painters, beauty required that the hair quote, be long, fine, and blonde, cheeks gleaming white, teeth even and gleaming white, and the neck round, slender, and gleaming white, end quote. 
In the Western tradition then, beauty tends to the feminine, blonde and gleaming white. It is raced and gendered. We can sometimes forget that beauty is a relationship and understand it as objective or subjective. Objectively understood, beauty can be judged, evaluated, determined. This is the realm of criticism, the canon, beauty pageants, the market, art, and film history. Subjectively understood, beauty is relative. My sense of beauty, my eye, is like no one else's. What stirs my pleasure or awe is singular to me. This is the realm of the personal, the authentic, idiom, spirit, transcendence, love. But three elements make up the experience of beauty, subject, object, and affect. The pleasure, attraction, or awe the perceiver feels at the sight, touch, or sound of the beautiful object or person. Beauty's pleasure moves the perceiver to act upon the object, to define it, replicate it, judge it, own it, purchase it, sell it, contemplate it, want it, seduce it, or love it. For the object, there is only one role, to be it. I would like now to turn to these roles as they have been understood in the cinema. And this is a critique. Cinema, a mass popular art, comes later to the other arts to questions of beauty and the human form. In mass media, beauty's pleasures are variously used. Representations of erotic beauty manufactured by cinematic craft technology, and casting provide a popular commercial draw. Beauty sells. We all know this. Critiques of commercialized visual pleasure, and in the cinema, beauty is, related, is termed visual pleasure, note the race and gendered um, nature of erotic cinematic beauty and its production. For the most part, in the Hollywood industry, on screen and off, white men act, have agency, look, and white women are looked at and acted upon. People of color partake of only the smallest sliver of the screen, on screen, on and off. While writing this presentation, I recalled that the first undergraduate essay on film that I ever wrote was tangentially about beauty. My essay analyzed the tagline for Roman Polanski's film, Tess. Tess was the first film Polanski made in Europe after fleeing rape charges in the US. The tagline for the film was, Tess, a victim of her own provocative beauty. Here, beauty's object provokes brings sexual victimization upon herself. It's a tautology. Here, beauty provides an aesthetic alibi for entangled, exploitive, on-screen, off-screen sexual misbehaviors and worse that the Me Too movement has recently addressed and exposed. Cinema also recounts what beauty excludes in John Stahl's 1933 Imitation of Life, a film about two mothers and their daughters, one pair white, the other black, a scene features the black teenage daughter, played by the stunning actress Freddie Washington, looking into a mirror. Gazing at her image, she says, why can't I be white? The black woman in classical cinema cannot even ask the somewhat abject question that white women ask of their mirrors, why can't I be beautiful? Beauty's traditional affiliation with whiteness and light excludes her. Hollywood cinema favors erotic beauty for its commercial draw, shaped by standards and norms. Beauty that instantly pleases beauty that is familiar, 
beauty that is easily consumed. We can say that what Hollywood's beautiful object is full of is shaped by cultural priorities, values, and biases, a consensus of the popular. Yet the forces of critique, demographics, and talent change what counts as beauty, as we can see in the greater and greater diversity on screens today. To conclude, I will turn to the personal, and here's the aspirational. I pose myself the question, what are the most beautiful films I have seen? Answering uh, the, my, the question that's often asked me, what's my favorite film, I find impossible. But I decided I would, I would just ask myself the question, and several films came to mind. Jane Campion's The Piano, Andre Tarkovsky's Stalker, but the film that came to me first and foremost and most powerfully was Charles Burnett's 1978 Killer of Sheep. Burnett made the film for $10,000 when he was an MFA directing student at UCLA. It was his thesis film. Because of the music rights, it wasn't officially released until 2008 and was immediately designated a national treasure by the Library of Congress. Set in Watts, the film follows an African-American family, Stan, a slaughterhouse worker, his wife, young children, and friends. Beyond everyday incidents, not much happens. The film is laconic. It conveys its meaning primarily through spare, beautiful black and white images. Here is one. A group of boys, age eight to 12, leap from the second story roof of one apartment building to another, immediately adjacent. The camera is below as we see one after another make the jump and we're looking up at them. The boys are exuberant, laughing, having fun. The shots capture their joy, the beauty of their bodies and the precarity inherent to their play. A friend asked me why, given its somewhat depressing subject matter, I find this film beautiful. I do so because of the singularity of the images the film gives us to contemplate. Because I have not seen these images, these framings, these subjects before. I do so because of the, of the beauty the film finds in precarity without a hint of pathos or condescension. I do so because the film is full, uh, is full of, I, I'm sorry, I do so because what the film is full of does not rely on conventional priorities, values, or biases, is not familiar or easy. Killer of Sheep's beauty showed me something I had not seen before, taught me something did something, its object was active. The pleasure it gave me was active, bracing. It knocked me back in my seat, took my breath away, awed me. I shared this film with you on streaming for the course website. Um, and Killer of Sheep gave me the occasion to speak tonight. See if you see it if you get the chance. It is beauty full, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Kathleen, and all four of you for terrific, terrific presentations. Um, and in, in my, if I were to call them beautiful presentations on the topic of beauty, I'm wondering if that's a tautology or an aspiration, and I'm <laughs> not yet sure. But the one thing I know is it's a beautiful set of four, four presentations together. Um, I, and I'm, I'm very struck by the way in which an idea of the body comes up in very different forms in relation to your own fields of work. Um, but that runs as a kind of theme through these, which we might tease out in a minute in, in an extended conversation around, around the ideas you bring up. But f my first question to open this up is, before receiving an email and an invitation from us to, to address the question of beauty, have you asked the question of yourself sometime recently or regularly in your own work? And when did you, do you have a memory of that first coming up in your own research and thinking about the kind of ideas that you presented here? 
What is beauty? Have you asked yourself that in the past, or did you wait for us to come in from the outside and prompt you? Speaking for myself, I, I can't say that I'd ever consciously thought of that. Mm. Um, and that made the assignment that much more interesting and challenging. Yeah. Yeah. Marla, your own research? Well, I think in the work that I do, um, I think I we're considering beauty all the time because when looking at sculpture or objects that are made by other people, those kinds of aesthetic evaluations are always at play. And I think that in my training as someone who's tried to look at the art of others using mm. criteria that are not strictly my own, it's, it's interesting how I find consistency, consistency in those aesthetic criteria in the sense of symmetry and when you see a beautiful sculpture from a, a culture, say, in, in West Africa, they, the, the women possess the same kind of qualities that we might value in, our, in ourselves. And so there's something that's interesting in that universality, but I, but I refuse to believe that there is a universality because, of course, mm. that goes directly against my saying that ideals of beauty are culturally constructed, which I believe they are. But still, there's something about the human being that is the thing we share that has features that are common that I think lend themselves to those judgments that are similar. Mm -hmm. So. Yeah, fantastic. Kathleen or, or J.A.? Um, well, uh, <coughs> I hadn't asked myself the question of beauty. Aesthetics comes up in film primarily with regard to film form because the question of, of beauty of, of the human body or figure, uh, I, I kind of came in with Laura Mulvey's visual pleasure and yeah. narrative cinema. So um, the, the, the idea of visual pleasure and aesthetics vis-a-vis -vis bodies was very much about a critique of gender. So, mm -hmm. um, so this sent me back to my complet roots and thinking about the tradition and how to but I ended up with the critique yeah. anyway. Yeah. I think about beauty all the time. Um, the difficulty for, or the challenge, uh, it, my work is all about obstacles and challenges and how to uh, work with them, and that's where the, the joy comes out of. Uh, for me, the, the challenge, the obstacle was, could I make my remarks and my point of view accessible to the people that were going to be in the room? Uh, I, I, I'm an observational artist. I think most, most artists are, uh, particularly in, in performance art as well as, as in fine and graphic art. So uh, I, I'm looking to find the beauty in how this young lady is bent over and writing down in her notebook. So uh, it, I think there, I, I, I believe so much in what you said that it starts, beauty starts from taking something simple and making it complex. That, that to me is, is everything about, about art. Mm. Uh, so I, I look for beauty everywhere, and then I try to see how I can make the invisible more visible to an audience. I also mm. think that's what we try to do on stage. Mm. Mm. You, your observation, Kathleen, near, near the end, that, that beauty is a kind of relationship, sometimes mm. between different subjects, between a subject and audience. It, it, there, there's a striking kind of relationship, one can imagine in that, to the idea of, of beauty as a form of uh, difference making. And that that's a kind of process. And that's another thing that kind of comes across in, in the presentations in different ways, that, that it's a sort of unfolding in time mm -hmm. of difference, either within a culture or between species and their environment. But that in each case, this body that comes up is in relation to something outside of itself. It might be the local culture. It might be the mm -hmm. environment, as you, as a scientist, describe it. But, but that kind of... Re the importance of a sort of relational or process-driven account for what beauty is, is is teased out in very different and interesting ways between the four of you. And at a certain level, one can imagine wanting to spend a great deal of time understanding what that larger context is for these individual objects or performances, whether it's an audience or a natural environment or a small part of a larger environment or the local communities that these cultures evolve around. And, and 
to a certain level, though I'm struck by how those environments are, the larger settings aren't being spoken of as much as the individual members or examples within them. And I wonder if they become a means then to try and understand these larger worlds that, that species or, or cultures operate within. Well, I think cultures are, uh, or people are highly aware of everything they see in front of them. I mean, that's what we do all the, all mm. the time, all day long, is take in people, look at their faces, think about what we see, what people wear. I mean, it's, and it goes on almost without thinking. These judgments, these calculations, these, these assessments, it's just part of being in the world. And sometimes you think about them in terms of beauty. You don't like to judge people, but you do. So, you know, it's kind of how we live in the world. And I think the, um, the great deal of difference that we're allowed in, say, our Western tradition of people having individuality in a way that I would not have seen in a Ganda community where individuality was not valued in the same way as we might, produces mm. a different visual universe. Because mm. conformity for us sometimes seems not something you aspire to, whereas elsewhere it's something you do aspire to. Right. You were, you were thinking in terms of performance on, the, on that front. Uh, you know, I think we're by nature, we're narrative animals. Um, if we hear a noise in the d at night in the other room, we go, oh, that's the cat jumping off uh, to, get, to get some water. We, we, we look up at the stars and we connect the dots and go, oh, that's a belt that a lion is wearing. So we, we, we tend to, to try to explain things for ourselves so we can survive and onslaught of stimuli. So I think in terms of the differences, I, 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 I tend to try to look at differences and see how they're related to me. I, I try to look at the differences and find the things as a nature that are, are so related. Um, diversity is what allows nature, correct me if I'm wrong, Professor, Diversity in nature is what allows a nature to continue to grow and to evolve and to prosper. And I think that that's something that we can, uh, perhaps as human beings, take a little more uh, acknowledgement of. Mm -hmm. and, and certainly your work, Paul, at, at a certain level, is about the building of models that account for those differences. And yeah, you know, it, uh, you know, I've, some of the things that, that have struck me here is, um, how Kathleen talking about this idea of, of desire and, and um, Marla talking about the, these cultural differences and beauty being cultural. Um, and yet you know, people can go into a different culture and um, you know, say go into a, a, a market in Africa and you can see uh, some piece of, of uh, local uh, you know, craft work, and you find it just intrinsically beautiful and desirable. Um, and uh, in in fish, I mean, there there are examples uh, in, in in biology where you can do these mate choice experiments to look at the attractiveness of certain features. And and a really good example of this is. There's these fish called sword tails, and they have different lengths of, of swords, these different lengths of projections off of the, the, the caudal fin. The, that's the back end fin. The, um, and you can artificially attach a longer fin to a particular fish, and even to a different species, it will, be, it will find it more attractive than an individual mm -hmm from its, its own species. And so one of the things I find remarkable in all of this is there really is so much individuality in terms of what we find desirable, what we find beautiful, and yet there's those individual, differ those individual differences can coalesce into these cultural differences, but we still have the ability to bridge them. And, um, you know, just, it just shows how, how plastic it, it all is. 
And plastic in time. Each of you touch on that mm -hmm. in different ways. We're sort of evolving, whether it's the continuous rehearsal of a piece to lead to a final mm -hmm. presentation, um, the evolution of the scarification over time at a moment in which that's changing dramatically. And I, it, it sort of begs questions around the extent to which that's conscious as a part of these events or, or, or consequences that are being observed by all of you in your own work as you're mm -hmm. doing it. Well, Paul, to your point, I think that w there's a real tension between sort of beauty or, or the response to beauty of the individual and then the culture industry and what the culture industry has produced for us 24-7, you know, in film and all the ancillary products and mm. advertising and so on, so that, that no one feels beautiful right, if they're measuring themselves against these cultural norms. And they're, they're uh, anyway, I, uh, but it does change, right? It does change, it is changing. We're seeing uh, many different kinds of bodies now presented as desirable or beautiful, but there is that tension between hmm. what culture is giving us, you know, and what we feel and how what we feel is shaped by those very pervasive images. And some things are up on the, you know, are, are in blockbusters and some things really aren't. So if you, if you step back and you, uh, back in time and, you know, go into these indigenous societies where, you know, there isn't media, there, there isn't film and advertising and a whole industry built around this notion of, of defining and creating what is, what is beauty. Um, how does it differ in these, I mean, do, do you have that same sort of phenomenon just without the technology or is it something that, that really evolves much more organically without any real intention? Well, I think it's a kind of a falsehood to imagine that communities living even in a remote part of Nigeria don't change mm. and don't change all the yeah. time. I think that we presume that that isolation is uh, a kind of a restricting, but it's not because you have ideas coming in all the time, even before everyone had their own cell phones and all the things that have now actually opened up the world to people that they had no idea about before. Because as soon as Europeans came and brought cloth and people began to incorporate these new things, but as they did, they were building on their original aesthetic and adding to it with new things until, as I said, the old things become prohibited and then you figure out how do we do without them, but still have the same systems of expressing who we are and what are the limits of that as things change? Do they broaden, mm. do they, you know, how do they alter? I think in general we're, as a species, uh, attracted and intrigued by difference until we feel threatened. And I don't know when that happened, that it changes from an attraction, uh, intrigued by something that's different, and then there's, it becomes something threatening. But uh, that, that idea of no matter what the isolation, there's always something that's coming in that's different. I mean, it, we, we, have, we have to keep human beings anyway, and most animals probably, from a certain amount of inbreeding. There needs to be a difference. There needs to, and I think that's maybe genetic. We, we're, att we're attracted to the difference to keep us changing and developing as human mm -hmm. beings. So I think beauty, I would say then beauty, whatever your definition of it is, can be healthy. I, I really do believe that. I mm -hmm. think we sometimes allow ourselves to be dictated to what a concept of beauty might be, but for me, the idea that beauty is noticing and appreciating something different, I think is a very healthy thing. I mean, a, a bit like Kathleen's observation about the idea of visual pleasure figuring into an account of beauty, you're touching on attraction and fear, also brings the question of emotion into the conversation in an interesting way. You know, that, that beauty, in and of, as a concept as we wrestle with it, has that dimension built into it in some way. It's a thing experienced, and we experience through emotion some degree, and not just observation in a more distanced way. Well, it's ve beauty is very sensory. 
It's all mm -hmm. about the senses. It's, mm -hmm. it's tactility, it's olfactory, it's everything combined. You know, it's not just one thing or the other. It's what we see, it's what we feel, it's what we smell, it's what we, you know, all those things come together huh. to make for an experience that's pleasant or pleasurable, but defined by oneself. Terrific. So Terrific. We're going to open it up, we'll open up the floor. We have microphones, as always, and we want to extend the conversation out, out into the room. And if our microphones are available, we've got a question right up front here. Thank you all so much. This was really very uh, inspiring. I have a question about um, any definitions uh, of beauty that are universal. We've talked about relative beauty. We've talked about sort of personal definitions of that, but have any of you in your various disciplines come across a more universal definition of beauty? I, I would say this personally, I don't know if I've come across a definition of it, but I would say that the, the sense of rigor and craftsmanship uh, as, a, as a partial definition of beauty I think is fairly universal. In my opinion, that's what I think. <laughs> Anyone else want to take that? <laughs> We're looking at one another. I'm not sure. I avoid universals. I don't know. Okay. <laughs> uh, questions, right up in the middle here in the audience. Let's. See. We're just bringing a microphone around. Sorry. Thank you. I have a question about something that hasn't been mentioned um, about terror and beauty and terrifying beauty. Um, images that we find terrifyingly beautiful or Baudelaire, Fleur du Mal. Um, how do you comment on that? On terror and beauty, the sublime, right? The, uh, um, uh, or images, for example, of 9-11 that many people have found terrifyingly beautiful. Mm. I know that's an extreme, but mm -hmm. there is that edge that one encounters in beauty. Well, I think one way, to, I don't know how to immediately respond, but, but one way is to think about, again, the affect, right? Because with the sublime, it's, you know, you're, you're floored to your being, and, I, and there is terror in it but maybe you can't take your eyes off of it. Um, yeah, I, I don't know much. Yeah. It seems to me that's a really see. important component of beauty in our culture these days as well. Mm. Mm -hmm. I, I think there's like also, a, a, there's a, just to use your specific of the 9-11, is there's a distance of time that allows the, the viewer to look at the image as an image itself uh, and not as a symbol for uh, an event. And I think that, that that might make a difference. Uh, I think not all the Greek plays, but a lot of the Greek plays are, uh, tragedies are extremely terrifying and deal with terrifying acts. Mm. And I, I bet that they had a, a very different reaction for, to the people watching them there than they would now. Thank you. And just, you know, Going back to what Jayad was saying earlier about beauties, uh, you know, eliciting an emotional response, I think that um, the kinds of images that you're talking about, um, they they are very emotional, and I think that uh, it, it does sort of tie into that same sort of uh, emotion pleasure center that that makes us think of things as, as beautiful. And, um, you know, whether that is uh, essentially just, you know, uh, evolutionary crossed lines where, you know, it just, it happens to trigger the same sort of system or whether there's actually some sort of, uh, you know, evolutionary advantage to, to that sort of uh, emotional trigger. Um, you know, th th there may be because 
those images being so, so captivating and powerful, they really do leave uh, an impression. And so it, it may actually influence how you live your life in the future because you know, those, those images just stay with you forever. And evolution in a way, while being beautiful, is also very terrifying. I mean, if you're not the fish that's got the big cuddle fin in the back that makes you good looking to other fish, so there's some, there is something ter necessarily terrifying about evolution, if you're not the one that gets to go forward. <laughs> Terrific. Uh, right up front here. We're getting to grad school. Um, I, this is kind of a personal question for all of you guys. Uh, since you know, beauty can be very you know, uh, and powerfully attractive, uh, and uh, when was the first time you experienced beauty in your particular field of study? And what was the emotional response mm -hmm. that drew you into a life pursuing your careers? Mine is, an pretty, outstanding question. mine is pretty, mm -hmm. mine is pretty question. cheesy. Um, <laughs> so much I, the better. I, I'm from San Antonio, Texas, uh, deep in the heart. And I grew up uh, in a very low-income family. Uh, I'm the first-generation college graduate and very proud of that. Um, and uh, in my house, we mostly watch telenovelas on our black and white triple console because that's what we, <laughs> anyway, but um, one day switching around when no one was home, I, this is a true story, it sounds really hokey, but it's really true. I came across the local PBS station and I saw, I swear to God, I didn't know anything from theater ever and I never even thought about this for 15 years later that it might happen. But I saw, I saw a great performance in theater in America, please. And it was about puppets, it was puppets, but it was this, a virtuosic man telling all these stories with puppets. And I just sat there and thought how beautiful it was. And it wasn't until uh, later as I watched the ending of it that it came out that it was one man who had done all the voices and all the puppets. And that, I don't even know what virtuosity was, but I was just blown away <laughs> by that something so beautiful could have happened on my, on my television. True story. I think my experience was here at UCLA as an undergraduate student in art history, taking my first course on the arts of Oceania, which was, first of all, I wasn't sure what Oceania was or what kind of art. I thought, well, art from under the sea. How <laughs> cool is that? <laughs> but it was actually a course about the arts of the Pacific, and it was taught in a large auditorium that's now actually in Broad, mm. and it was taught by a person, a professor named Arnold Rubin, who was actually became my mentor. And he showed us images of masqueraders coming out of a men's house in Papua New Guinea, in the in, um, and these masquerades were extended the human body to tremendous height and they, they kind of poured out of this dark darkness into the light. And the images, the slides were projected very large and in those days you didn't often get rooms where they could throw a slide far enough to get that. And I just thought, I can't believe people do this. I've never seen anything like it. Mm -hmm. It was huh. so stunning a little terrifying to imagine that these kinds of things were going on yeah. in the world as you know, a little girl from Los Angeles, never saw anything like it. And it totally changed my life because I probably would have ended up studying Impressionism or something, but <laughs> instead, hmm. you know, I, I was completely riveted by this idea of exploring the unknown and s finding beauty and excitement about you know, what that meant and what I could learn from it. Uh, it's a great question. And my experience is a little anomalous as I'm thinking about it, but it was a, uh, when I was an undergrad and I took a film theory class and it was very dense and we were reading a lot of, you know, Marx and Nietzsche and, and the 
I would have this experience during lectures where I would be following what the lecture was both conceptually but with images. Images would run through my head and the relationship between images and thought in, in film, both the, the ideas you attach to images but also how images attach themselves to thought. And it was kind of an amazing experience. So. Here I am. <laughs> um, so most of my life, I actually, or most of my youth, I thought I was going to be a musician. Um, and uh, it was much later, actually, after I had gone to grad school and um, was visiting my mom at home, that uh, my former first grade teacher came over, and we all did these assignments in first grade. It was the one assignment she kept from every student, which is, what are you going to be when you grow up? And um, <laughs> mine was, I was going to be a scientist. Um, so something happened very early on before I was really conscious uh, of, of, of this path that, that I ultimately took. Um, but there's certainly been, like going back to that musical side of things, there have been many uh, moments in my life where, you know, I've heard a piece of music for the first time, and uh, one immediate example that comes to mind, uh, when I first got a, a recording of Philip Glass' solo piano, which kind of, in kind of goes with the complexity and simplicity thing, because melodically it's yeah. very simple, even though it's incredibly busy, um, and. I couldn't, sl I, I put it on and I, I couldn't go to sleep. I just listened to it over and over because I was, I had such an incredible emotional reaction to it and I was trying to figure out why, you know, and, and I, I didn't sleep at all. I just listened to it over and over all night long. Fantastic. Uh, what's that? Yes, Philip Glass, uh, solo, solo piano. piano. Amazing, fantastic. Uh, more questions? Let's go up to the top. There's a question right in the middle there, and then we're going to come down. Students, if you've got any questions down here. Just right in the middle of the top row there, yep. Just right here. It's a traveling microphone. It's a communal act. Uh, my question is like for the scarification, it, it r reminds me of like foot binding in ancient China. Mm -hmm. So it was like the beauty center at that time, but it apparently caused dar uh, harm to like your body. I think the same uh, applies for like tattoos, piercing, also like even the wearing of high heels. So my question was like, what's your attitude toward the fact that we sometimes say like there's a price we need to pay for beauty, and like. Mm -hmm. Right, um, English no, is not my like language, so like I hope I say it clear. Yeah, thank yeah. you. That, uh, that's a very good question, mm -hmm. and um, I didn't actually speak about this, but of course, all of these transformations, whether it's foot binding or body scarification, are all about pain, and it's about a test of endurance. It's about the price you pay to belong. It's like. We all suffer for beauty. How many of us have worn stupid shoes and you know they look really great, but you break your feet? I mean, that's a much more superficial thing than actually modification of the body. But I think that there's a side to it where you, you wonder if this is violence against women, the binding of feet, the, the cutting of skin. You know, How do we feel about that, looking at it as Westerners from the outside, because that's, that's a question that you have and you certainly think it. But it's also a kind of test of personal empowerment that you can actually endure and overcome because the result is worth the price of pain. So I think it's, it's complicated and I definitely think it's part, of, it's part of what it takes to belong. It's part of what it takes to grow up and we suffer in our own lives in different ways, maybe not as radically as these, but I think that was part of it. It was how, how do we test you to make sure that you've got the muster to be one of us? And that 
those were the tests. That, and for the boys where I worked, they had, they had initiations where they were going into a remote location and being subjected to all sorts of ordeals that they had to overcome. And it was the same kind of thing. It just did not leave the indelible markings on the body because I think women's bodies are more powerful. They are the containers of the future. So that's partly why they're, they're marked or women's feet are bound. Building on what Marlo was saying, so I just like threw myself in there. Um, I wonder if the audience could talk about the psychic, aside from like shoes that, you know, give you, I don't know, blisters, um, uh, what the psychic price of beauty is in um, your own experience. Yeah, so that actually segues really well into, I have a comment and then sort of a question. I kind of wanted to push back on the idea of like um, prizing individuality in our society because I think there's a lot of like Eurocentric Western ideals of beauty that a lot of women, especially non-white women, actually have to s undergo um, in this culture that are body modifications, for example, extensive hair removal, often permanent hair removal, um, and then also men, some men in, in all over the world undergo circumcision, which is also um, a ritualized form of body modification. So um, I would say that in that case, I mean, there are movements, feminist movements especially, that encourage women to keep their body hair, but I definitely have suffered my entire life from being of Middle Eastern descent and having more body hair than like a white woman would. So um, I just wanted to add that. Um, and then I, I wanted to ask you all what your idea of ugliness is, which I mean, I guess is the opposite of beauty or, or maybe not ugliness, but just the opposite of beauty. And if you think that is also subjective. That's a great question. And w w one, of the, one of the directions that a study of beauty goes is to, to what's excluded, to w because beauty always excludes. There is who is not beautiful and, and what are their qualities or characteristics. And um, I think that w w one of the ways um, that we can think about what is excluded is anything that's not normative, right? Um, you know, non-symmetrical faces, um, people who are differently abled, right? Um, that that um, or or their their embodiment is not normative, um, and beauty can be very destructive. Uh, can be a very destructive idea when we think about its opposite, we think about ugliness, we think about you can't get in, you can't be in this space of beauty. And Toni Morrison, the famous novelist, she once said that she thought that beauty and romantic love were the most destructive ideas in the Western tradition because they always, you know, because there are people who are in and people who are not. So that's how I'd respond to the question of ugliness. Um, those are, all three are really tremendous questions and uh, it's also tricky for me to be honest to talk about some things now a as, a, as a male. Uh, but I'll say this, um, what's interesting to me perhaps is uh, that why the question is, is for me really more interesting is because it's, it's not a question that you actually deal with a lot with men. Uh, there, the, that, I that imposed uh, notions of, of beauty and yes, that, that is you do accept some things, you do uh, ex accept, how, how did I write this down? Uh, is it imposed, is it an imposed, uh, is it something that is imposed on you to be accepted or to be whatever you consider might be beautiful or is it something that you accept and you take on? And I think that, uh, and I know I'm treading on, on, on thin ice, but I think that that's an issue where because of the uh, dominance where more things are imposed on women than are men. Uh, there are men who, who 
has scarification and who have things that change their, uh, in their uh, appearance, but I it's not the same as for a man, for a woman. It's very different issues. Uh, and I, I, I think that that's a, a, big, a big part of it. Uh, in terms of, does that make sense what I've said so far? Uh, there's a lot less things that we as male, and I'm a person of color, but still, as a male, there's a lot less things in terms of my, s and I do have to worry about my, my self-identity still, but there's a lot less things I have to worry about than people who are not men. Uh, secondly, in terms of what is ugliness, Absolutely, absolutely. Uh, she thinks it also depends on what culture or group that you are a part of. Um, in terms of the, the concept of what is ugly, and again, this is just my opinion. It does not reflect the School of Theater, Film, and Television <laughs> or theater. Um, that, and this is simplistic, but I, I find very little in nature to be ugly. I really do. It's man-made imposition that turns something that might be beautiful into something that's ugly. Nature is chaotic, but even the chaos of nature in its destructive paths, whether a lava field flowing down or after a hurricane, if it's just nature, there's an odd beauty to it. But when you, you can look at like the lushness, I, I, I live in upstate New York, even though I live in California now. It's very lush and beautiful. Uh, you look at a tropical rainforest, it's very, very beautiful. You look at, at a desert, whether rocky desert in West Texas, or whether uh, high desert in California, or whether large sand deserts like the Sahara, they're all still beautiful. They're, they're different visions, but they're all beautiful. But then you take that beauty and you put something in it that man has made, whether it's debris or debris, and it changes it. I don't know if that makes sense, but I, 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 that's how I feel. I feel like there's very little in the natural world that is really ugly. Uh, we, as human beings, tend to mess things up and make it ugly. And sometimes by putting our perceptions of what beauty is, we turn something that's beautiful and different into something ugly. Marla, Paul, any of you? Um, I was just responding to Judith and thinking that in, in cultures elsewhere, the men are the pretty ones. Mm -hmm. There are men that, I mean, they do the hair and they, I mean, there are all kinds of ways that the gender thing flips. And um, we haven't talked about hair. I mean, we have, it was brought up by you, but um, in fact, the ab ability to manipulate hair is a major capacity that humans have. And if you look cross-culturally, you can see the extraordinary things that people have created just by using mostly the hair on their heads. But it's, it's, it's e it is either gone or it's there, but it's, it's part of norms of beauty. Um, so I, I guess it's, I want to go back just briefly to this uh, idea of, of like the scarification or the foot binding. Um, you know, imposing some sort of, of, of burden. Um, and just point out some examples in uh, the animal world where this is actually quite common. So if you look at the, uh, the antlers of something like an elk, you know, that's 35 pounds of, of calcium that gets acquired, uh, extruded, and shed on a yearly basis. And, you know, the males are identified as being more attractive by the larger the antlers. And the evolutionary theory behind this is that it is displaying the ability to deal with quite an imposing burden. And that if an animal like that can withstand such a burden, it must be uh, a really good mate because it, it has really good genes because a weaker animal would not be able to survive that. And so I think sometimes, uh, you know, we have a tendency to 
differentiate ourselves from animals a little too much and forget that some of these behaviors that have evolved for hundreds of millions of years in, in all sorts of different animals, that some of those behaviors and uh, ways that pleasure centers are triggered, they, they still exist. A and so um, I, I, think it's, I, I don't think it's unfair to, to view uh, some of these things in, in terms of um, uh, a burden that's being imposed on, on women. Uh, you know, I also think that, you know, there, if you look at it uh, from the perspective of, of men, they, they may not be doing the, the foot binding or the scarification as much, although and they do in some places. Um, but, you know, a lot, of, a lot of what are imposed on men often are behaviors. So, you know, you look at whether it's ritualistic uh, combat, uh, you know, in Papua New Guinea, or actual combat, or, you know, uh, you can look at something like, like Maasai, where, you know, it used to be the, the, the way that you became a man as, as a Maasai was, you know, you slayed a lion. And um, so there, there's a lot of behaviors that we undergo because it is displaying our, it, it's, it's a way of manifesting our attractiveness and our reproductive uh, virility. Because if you can deal with that, if you can deal with being cut thousands of times, um, that, that must mean that this is a very strong individual that's gonna have offspring that are more likely to survive. And even if someone's not thinking that, it's probably somewhere programmed deep in our, in our DNA um, that triggers some sort of pleasure center towards attractiveness. Um, but then going back to the question about ugly, uh, I'll just give a one word answer, intolerance. Simple as that. That's ugly. Terrific. Sorry? Final statement. We're so I'm sorry, we've just come to a close. Our, our time has run out, so we like to end, end each of the sessions and see if any of you have a final statement you'd like to make, if there's something that might have come up in the course of the conversation or in the questions from the audience. What's the 30-second rant? <laughs> <laughs> we want to give you that opportunity. I just think it's been great to have all of us from different disciplines meeting in the middle and you know hearing you talk about you know how sort of physical power is about, you know, survival and, re and reproduction and continuity in ways that I don't think about, but of course it's very parallel to even the kind of concept. We haven't talked a lot about conceptual systems and the mystical and all these other ways in which people understand themselves in the world that have to also have to do with beauty, but that's, that's left for another day. I was going to talk about all of that, but I ran out of time, so I'm terribly sorry. Yeah. Um, I, I, I just want to say this. I do want to thank you all sincerely for coming tonight, and um, my, my new colleagues, it was a pleasure to spend time and space with you. Uh, I also want to say this. Um, it's complicated. Life is complicated. The notion of what is beauty is complicated. The notion of uh, what is uh, taken on or imposed is complicated. I think it's wonderful, and this is one of the great things that we do at UCLA, is we begin the conversation. We don't end it. There is no answer. It's a, it's a, it's a conversation that's ongoing. Uh, I, I do want to say this as well, um, is that in my work, uh, I deal a lot with theme. What's the theme? What is it about? Um, and I always believe that every theme also contains its opposite. So if you talk about uh, Romeo and Juliet, uh, what's the meaning of love? It also contains the opposite is, you know, what is hate? So I think the, qu the notion of what is beauty also contains its opposite of what, what might not be beautiful. And uh, I, I think in the last five minutes we opened up just the beginning, right? My head is spinning, talking about things that are complicated 
and really difficult to speak about, particularly in an open forum, but I'm, I'm so happy that we're able to, probably in terms of tolerance, because intolerance also includes its, its difference of tolerance, to be able to have these kind of, um, I don't want to say enlightened and I don't want to say educated, but just to have these kind of meaningful conversations. And so thank you for allowing me to have that conversation with you. Great question. Um, I'd like to wrap up just by thanking the audience for the really great questions and comments. Um, thinking about the sublime, thinking about memory, and um, thinking about what, you know, how we inhabit standards of beauty with our own bodies and live with that and, and, um, or not, and, and the sort of challenges that causes. So I want to thank the audience. Yeah. Thank you. So I guess what I'd like to leave you with is, is to really think about, uh, you know, we were, we were forced to, to think about what beauty is. And I think that too often um, in our very busy world, uh, we don't stop to think about things. And I think that within our society, there is so much that is wrapped up in the notion of what is beauty that it seems like it merits some time to really think about that and try to unpack it and think about, you know, what is, what is beauty to you? And why do you think the things that you think are beautiful? Why do you think that? And, you know, some of it could be something intrinsic to yourself. Sometimes it could be things that are coming from society. And some of those, uh, some, of, some of that can be innocuous and some of it can be damaging. And so I think if, if we all just, you know, spend some time, think about it, ask yourself. And, um, you know, I think if more people did that, uh, we wouldn't maybe have so much uh, baggage that's, as, that's associated with it. Thank you all for your wonderful presentation today. Thank you so much for joining us. Um, in addition to the suggestion being made to think hard and to think on from the conversation that started here, do the other thing I suggested early in the introduction. Record that thought for us. Go online. If you live in a world of hashtags, I understand many of us do. Um, record that thinking immediately, in, in real time. Respond to it. Students, as you upload your comments and feedback, you gain access then to everybody else's thinking on this topic. Thank you, everybody, for coming in. We'll see you next Tuesday. Please join me in thanking our guests for taking their time and coming in today. Thank you all.